as a bit of a Christmas Grinch. I, I know this is true because all three of my daughters and all one of my wife have confirmed it at different times. Now, to be honest, it would be okay with me, I guess. I have to say I think there's some reasons I don't get along with this greatest of all retail holidays. When I was a father, when I was a, a, a boy, I should say, my father was uniquely talented in not quite getting me the right gift. Uh, I remember one Christmas I wanted a robot. There had been a robot that was popular that had a, a control, not a wireless control. They didn't have those in those years. This had an actual wire that went to the robot. But you had a control and you could move the robot forward or you could move him to the right or to the left or even backwards. <clears throat> and I wanted that robot. And when my father went to get the gift, he found a robot that had a, like a flywheel inside of it that you wound up and it would just go forward straight like this. It couldn't do anything with it. It, it, it was great. I'm thankful for the, the robot. Not really. But it, it, it was, it was uh, not the right, right robot. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that robot met its demise with a firecracker that next July. <laughs> not. Remember Mattel rifles? Does anybody remember those here? Oh, I, I, I wanted one of those Mattel rifles that had a lever action. and They had these metal kind of cartridges with a spring inside of it and a plastic bullet. Today, every toy you have says... Caution, choking hazard. This one should have said, caution, shoot your friend's eye out hazard. And, and so you'd put these bullets in there, and then you put a cap on the back, these green caps. And, and then you could load your rifle, and you could shoot these bullets. You could shoot them at single shot, or you could shoot it like a lever action that would go out like that, and just like the rifleman in that old show. And boy, I wanted that rifle. And Lo and behold, underneath the Christmas tree, there appeared a box that was about the right size. Yeah, it weighed a little bit too much, but maybe there was batteries included. I didn't know. And, and I opened it up on Christmas Eve when we opened up our Christmas gifts. I opened it up, and my father had actually bought me a real rifle, a real 22, a Marlin saddle gun, which I still have to this day someplace. A wonderful gift, but even as a boy, I knew I couldn't shoot anybody with that rifle. <laughs> and so it wasn't, it wasn't a fun gift for me if you get my drift, okay? <laughs> then my, my father, one year, was in charge of getting the Christmas tree because my mother had been hospitalized, and so he went out and bought a Christmas tree. It was all of four feet tall. Who buys a four-foot-tall Christmas tree? And so we had to put it up on a, on a card table, except in our family we didn't play cards, so we didn't call it a card table, it was a folding table. And, and so we put it on the folding table and had to put a little sheet around that so it would look tall enough to celebrate Christmas and put our gifts around that. Now it wasn't all my father's fault. Two Christmases ago we had uh, our family coming into town and had our granddaughter coming from Canada, who's here this morning. It's good to have Natasha back and Kari next to her. And, and so we'd made big plans. We were going to go over to the Great Wolf Lodge in the Wisconsin Dales and just, you know, spend some good time there. And that was, that'd be great, except my uncle died. And I had to do the funeral, except I didn't get to do the funeral because both Susan and I became ill with norovirus. Now, norovirus is a great weight loss plan. But it doesn't do much to inspire the Christmas spirit in a Grinch like me. Now, I have to admit, it has changed me a little bit. I'm just thankful every Christmas I'm not sick after that experience. So I'm a bit of a Grinch. But you know something? <clears throat> there is something about that manger. There's something about that baby that was laid in that manger. It must have been absolutely incredible to touch the hands of Jesus. 
those little baby hands with those little perfect fingernails, to, to just touch them must have been incredible. Our first biological daughter was born in La Paz, Bolivia, which is 12,500 feet above sea level. She was born at full term at 4 pounds 11 ounces. And so the, the pediatrician, Dr. Masi Masi, I still remember his name and I like to pronounce it every now and then. So Dr. Masi Masi insisted that she had to be in the incubator for a week. And we couldn't touch her. Susan couldn't feed her. She was in this box away from us. And I will never, ever forget when we finally got her out and I was able to actually touch my daughter. And of course, I did what anybody does. I took my little finger, my pinky, and I, I opened her fingers and I put that in her hand and she grasped on. And I knew my daughter. By the way, uh, pinky comes from the Dutch pink, which means little finger. That's why we call it a pinky. So if you have nothing else you can take away from the sermon today, there you go. <laughs> That's just great. When I, when I held Krista's finger, it was like she said to me, Poppy, it'll be great, it'll be fine. I know you didn't read all the books Mommy wanted you to read before I was born. But, but you'll do okay. You'll do fine. I wonder what it was like to put their pinky in the hand of Jesus. Maybe Mary was too tired. It had been a long trip after all. Pregnancy, young lady. Maybe she was just tired of the visit. I don't know. But if she was like any other mother, and I suspect she was, she wanted to hold or put her finger into Jesus' hand. And when she did, she touched the hand of God. After birth, most babies have their fingers closed around their thumbs. That's why you can do that little trick with the pinky finger, your pinky finger in their hand. But they gradually begin to use their hands and open up, and that's a natural sign of development. In fact... Those 27 bones and connecting tissue that make up the human hand continue to develop from the time of infancy until they grow into young adulthood. Jesus, when he was about three months old, he would have been able to hold a, a rattle or the equivalent of a rattle in his hand. Of course, anytime you put something into a baby's hand, you have to be careful because it's about ready to go into their mouth as well. I didn't read the books, but I know that. And, and then about six to nine months, you have this experience where they can be able to take a rattle in this hand and be able to look for another rattle with that hand. And so that becomes kind of the two-handed motions they're able to make. By the time they're 10 months, the baby ought to be able to have the pincer movement where they, they take their finger and thumb and they're able to pick up small objects like a piece of cereal or other little piece of fruit or something. And those hands continue to develop. And Jesus, because he came into his own creation, his hands would have developed in the same way. So by the time two years had gone by and those wise men came, because it probably took him that long, when he saw those gifts, he was able to reach out his hands and want to touch them and want to feel them. And that would have been part of his experience as well. My best guess, and it's in my sanctified imagination, is that they might have used some of the value of those gifts to help them when they went down to Egypt. Not sure of that, but it could have been used for that. So Jesus grew from infancy to that toddler stage, but toddlers and infants do not stay toddlers and infants, do they? Gradually, little boys, little baby infant boys grow into little boys. And we mostly know what that means, don't we? <clears throat> little boys like to do little boy things with their hands. When I was a boy, I had a fascination with insects and frogs and snakes. Fortunately, we don't have very many venomous snakes here in Minnesota. And I'd like to touch them and play with them and unfortunately do some things to them. 
You know, I bet you when Jesus was in Egypt, he probably played with his little boy hands with the little boy critters they had in Egypt at that time because he was a fully human boy. One thing I do know is that he did something else with his hands. The Jewish people in those days would read from rolls of scripture like this, usually made out of animal skins, and the scriptures had been copied onto there, and Jesus would have had a probably a metal tool to avoid touching and smudging because the ink never went fully in, and he would go along and read from right to left in the Hebrew, and he learned the scriptures. How do I know that he did that as a little boy? Because when he was 12 years of age, it says this in Luke 2, 46 to 47. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Absolutely incredible. How did he do that? Because he studied the scriptures. He took his hands and he went through the parchments and he understood the word of God under the influence of the Holy Spirit just like we can learn from the scriptures as well. Little infants don't stay infants. Little boys, and we thank the Lord for this, do not stay little boys, but they grow, and they grow into young men. In the society where Jesus lived, really you went directly from being a little boy to an adult. There wasn't this kind of artificial stage of adolescence or anything. Jesus went to work, and he developed the strong hands of a young workman. Following the example of his earthly father, Jesus began to work with Joseph in the shop. It says in Luke 2.52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Part of the way he grew in favor with men by was working in that shop. The poet Ted Hughes wrote a poem entitled A Working Hand. It says in part this, there's an honesty in a working man's hand. The simple truth of bread and butter earned by blisters. Jesus was in the shop with his father. And he earned his bread and butter and the bread and butter of his family with his blisters. Hands can tell stories, can't they? All of our hands at a certain point in life tell stories. Mine do. I, I have a, a little mark here in my hand that comes from sixth grade when Robin, the young lady that sat in front of me, put her number two pencil into my palm. I won't tell you what I was doing immediately beforehand. It wouldn't be prudent. I once asked my mother, because I have different marks on my hands, I don't know where I received them from, and I, I asked my mother, where, where did I get these scars from? And she said, oh, Woody, you did so many things when you were a little boy. How am I supposed to remember all of them? I do remember one. I have a scar over here that I had an idea of making my own gun. So I had a pop gun. You know, the ones that have corks in the front of them, and when you shoot the trigger, the air compression shoots the corks out. I had one of those. And so I cut off the, the barrel of my pop gun, and I, I connected it to a piece of wood, and then I built a handle onto it. I crimped off the back of those two barrels that were open, and I poured gunpowder in there. Again, I'm not going to tell you where I got the gunpowder from. And, and I made uh, lead, lead bullets, basically, out of solder. I melted it down and made these round bullets. And then I put some cloth in there, because I'd seen that in the movies, put a fuse into it, and lit it. And that's why I have an inch and a half scar right here. <laughs> Pop gun barrels don't stand up to gunpowder. If you're a young man here today, learn from my poor experiences. Jesus developed calluses, probably had scars, even though he 
he measured twice and cut once because he was perfect. He, he, he still developed scars, those working man hands. And he was primarily identified as a worker. I'm not sure about this, but there was a Roman palace that was built 10 kilometers from Nazareth, 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 which we used to say was about 200 people. The most recent archaeological evidence indicates it was more like 2,000. A number of workmen there probably went to Sephora and they helped build that palace. And it was during the time Jesus would have been growing up, perhaps during his adolescence. So it came to the point that when Jesus was actually teaching, the people in his community said, where did this man get these things or get this knowledge, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the carpenter? They couldn't see him as the Messiah. They could only see him as the carpenter, perhaps because of his hands. Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. The carpenter who had become the rabbi was not accepted because they could only see him as what he had been among them. Well, at 30 years of age, Jesus began that public ministry. Probably did this because men in those days had to be of 30 years of age to have disciples, their own disciples. They could have been a disciple before of someone else, but now they could have their own disciples if they'd learned. And so Jesus, at 30 years of age, begins his public ministry. It could have been because those daughters, which were mentioned here, well, he had to continue to support them until they were married, probably when they were 13, 14, or 15 years of age. And so Jesus continued to work to support them. But then he came into his public ministry and his hands still had a part in that. He touched many people to heal them. Luke chapter 4, verse 40 and 41. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness. And laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. Imagine this for a moment. Here are these people coming to Jesus with this sickness, some of them with skin diseases, some oozing sores, others manifesting the characteristics of someone that's been controlled by a demon. And rather than rejecting them, rather than stepping away as so many people would be tempted, he reached out and touched that diseased skin. And he touched that demonic person. And he gave them that sense of human touch. The first university I attended was an engineering school in East Texas. When I went there to study, and my first degree was in engineering technology, I... I, I was among real engineering types. There's only about 3% of our, our school that were women, and that means you're never going to get a date there. And, and then the rest were these true pocket protector kind of pens and pencils, slide rule in those days, kind of engineers. And they were not touchy-feely individuals. And I remember going to school there and just longing for the touch of another human being. And these diseased people long for the touch of Jesus. It's not the only time his hands are mentioned. A few more that I can give you. He touched a physically handicapped woman in Luke 13. On a Sabbath or on a Saturday, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten it up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And then, what did he do? It says, he put his hands upon her. 
this woman who was bent over for 18 years, walking around, having to engage in every conversation like this. Probably some physical underlying problem, but we know a demonic oppression as well. And Jesus reaches out and touches her, and she stands up for the first time in 18 years. And of course, all the religious people were thrilled by that. No, that's not true. They said, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. But Jesus saw a woman in need, a woman bent over, and he touched her, and she stood up by the power of God. Now, I've told you I'm a Grinch. But even I enjoy children at Christmas time. I have some younger grandchildren coming this week. They'll arrive on Christmas night. We'll have supper together and then have our Christmas celebration. There's something special about seeing Christmas through a child's eyes. In Luke 18, people were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. They rebuked them for bringing the children to him. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter into it. And Jesus touched the children. You know, those hands, those perfect little hands, those little hands with the perfect fingernails that were in that manger, those hands that, that played as a little boy and read the scriptures, those hands that developed calluses and scars as they worked in that shop, those hands that touched the people that so needed him didn't end there because those hands were finally nailed to the cross. Luke 23, 33 says, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. They would have taken a five to seven inch long iron nail. It would have been placed between the carpals and the radius. It was driven through, not breaking any bone. We know that. It would have transected the median nerve and impaled the flexor pollicis longus. As part of that, shooting waves of pain would have come up his, his arm. At the same time, because of the damage to the ligaments and nerve, the hands would have been constricted probably into a claw-like form as he hung there. And those perfect little baby hands were now the wounded hands that hung on the cross. Of course, all that brutality would have done nothing if Jesus, in this public ministry of three and a half years, if he hadn't ministered perfectly. In every moment, in every occasion, he ministered perfectly and he became the perfect sacrifice. And even when he was back in the shop here and he was working away and he slammed his thumb with a hammer, he did so without sin and became the perfect sacrifice. And this is the hardest one for me, even as a little boy, knowing personally what little boys are like. He was perfect in all his ways. And even going back to the manger, born without original sin, born perfectly, He did all of that so he could go to the cross for us. And you know, even after the cross, he used his hands because he held out his hands. And he said to his disciples, look at my hands if you want to see who I am. He broke bread on the Emmaus Road, and when they saw him break bread with his hands, they knew it was Jesus. And when they saw him by the shore of Galilee, they saw him eating. They knew it was Jesus by his hands. The resurrected Jesus 
who came to take away the curse from us. I love that third verse in Joy to the World. You know, Joy to the World was not written as a Christmas carol. Instead, Isaac Watts was going through a study of the Psalms, and Joy to the World was written to be a poetic treatment of Psalm 98. It was about a century later that people put it to music, and it became the great Christian song that we sing today. That third verse says, No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings known. Far as the curse is found. Far as the curse is found. Far as, far as. The curse is found. I don't know what your Christmas is lying up to be this year. But the hands of Jesus, Jesus who yes, was born in a manger, but Jesus who lived his incarnate life, are being offered to you once again. And if you've never done it before, I encourage you to reach out and grab the hands of Jesus which are extended to you. And by doing that, trust in him and becoming his child. Let's pray together.